why did I not see that? How did I ignore that? How did I let myself believe that my kids were safe? How did I put them back in their lives? I put them, I gave him access to them. Amanda, um, you were very young when you met your husband, right? T tell us a little yes. bit about that and what it was like and we'll sort of get into what he uh, was doing. Yeah, so I was 18 and, you know, 18, 19 when we started dating. So very young. I thought I was all grown up though, <laughs> as I think most 18, 19 year olds believe. And uh, when we actually start, we met and started dating, he was actually married to another, his his second wife. And in my 18, 19 year old self, I believed that it was true love. And I believed that his marriage was ending. And it took actually a year before he left her. And then my 19 year old self thought, huh, I was right. I won. And we proceeded to move in together and eventually got pregnant and then got married. And I thought my life was pretty perfect. You know, we, we didn't connect as much after three children and working full time, but I thought everything was pretty good. I was a full time stay at home mom after we had kids and my whole focus was my family. Mm. And were there, was it? Any signs, I suppose, uh, and we haven't got in, into, you know, what what he was doing, but were there any signs at the time that he was a sort of, had these dark thoughts? So, yes, uh, in hindsight, <laughs> as I think that usually is the case. In hindsight, absolutely, there were a lot of red flags that I didn't have the foresight to understand, um, including being 18 and him being very excited about photos of me at 16 and I had, a, I had a very promiscuous teenage time and he romanticized it and wanted details wanted photos all of that and again you think you're all grown up when you're a teenager and so it didn't spark me as anything other than oh this almost 30 year old man is very excited by me and that was fun and exciting at the time did, did, did that feel a bit like that's sort of the teenage me that's still me and it's so it's just me that he's interested in exactly you know you're at 18, 16 is two years ago. It's not, you don't think that much has changed. And it didn't really put two and two together until much, much later. You know, he also wanted other people to join us in the bedroom in ways that I was not comfortable with. I mean, there was a lot of pressure there and he eventually, eventually dropped it, but so much so that he, that I actually considered it because he made me feel guilty for doing those things in my teenage years and not wanting to do them with him. Oh. And again, hindsight. Um, but it, but I thought, you know, everybody's got their, their thing. And who am I to judge what his things are when, you know, I, I believed everything else was, you know, I thought, I thought we had a good relationship. And then when he eventually dropped it, I, th I thought he was, he decided he was going to be satisfied with just, just me. These are all things that I suppose like they, they, they're all relevant, but they're only relevant in hindsight and because it's on a spectrum it, i suppose and there must be people even listening is. to this thinking oh well i've sort of might have pushed my wife or husband to do these certain things and i i don't i'm not a malevolent person but this person it turned out was exactly you know and i knew that he watched pornography for instance and i don't ultimately think all pornography is bad but i wasn't interested in participating i never felt like the girls actually are enjoying themselves and that's not attractive for me and yet he never really insisted I watch it with him, but I didn't know which kind of pornography he watched. I didn't check in on those things. And society today says, well, everybody does it. It's okay. Unless you know, you don't know. And, you know, if he didn't pressure me, then you just sort of look the other way. And I think that's pretty normal and common in society today is we think well, that that's just a, it's just normal. And obviously some parts of it can be and some parts of it cannot be. Did you feel him becoming less um, attracted to you as you got a little bit older? I wouldn't say less attracted. I had three children and I was, I gained quite a bit of weight through pregnancies and I didn't feel attractive to myself for in the same way. And so I didn't really ever relate it to me getting older. I mostly just thought, you know, I, I need to work on myself. And we still were intimate a good two or three times a week, which is more than a lot of married couples, but it also felt very obligatory in a lot of ways. Like I, I, I was, I, that was my role. And 
you know, it didn't felt it didn't feel connected in the in the way that I really wanted. But I also we had three young children, and he worked long hours. I it was the season was my excuses in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's so difficult to know. And I guess there was also the situation where you were, I guess, the housewife. He was earning the money, so it was difficult. Was it difficult to sort of uh, broach? the conversation difficult conversations with him yes uh 100 i wasn't if i was broaching a difficult conversation or if i was saying i needed more i needed you to show up and have dinner with the family for instance that was a big one for me you know i'd call him at 5 five thirty, and when he coming home from work and i would get told soon and soon meant when i finish what i'm doing if i don't get distracted maybe i'll be home by bedtime and it was really frustrating because I wanted more. I wanted a deeper connection. I wanted him to participate in the family. But if I asked for it, I was made to feel guilty because he was doing the very best he could. And how dare he imply that he wasn't doing everything for us. And I felt guilty that I wasn't financially providing. I wasn't contributing in that way. And so how dare I question his commitment to us when that's what he was doing. And so... You know, there was a lot of that. I didn't know how to have hard conversations because he would shut down or make me feel wrong for the feelings I was having. It, we live in a society that um, typically men propose to women. What what led you to propose to him? So I was six months pregnant, truthfully. I was pregnant and it was not on, it wasn't a planned event. But when I got pregnant, I was 22 and thought we were in a committed relationship. We owned a house together. I guess we're going to do this. It was sooner than I expected. And he had finally divorced his second wife, but he had a lot of wounding around. He was 30 and already married and divorced twice and really struggled with the idea of being married again. And I wanted to be part of this family. I wanted to have the same last name as my new child. I I felt like if we were going to do this, we should do this. And so I ended up proposing to him in a, come on, let's get on with this sort of way. And he did say yes. And I did plan our wedding in six weeks. And we were married in February of 2010. And then I had my first child in April 2010. Do you remember being nervous for, to propose? And did you do like a whole like romantic thing out of it? I was kind of nervous in a, I've never done something like this. I'm pretty sure he's going to say yes. I am pregnant with his child. Uh, we went out to dinner it was a little bit awkward because he didn't quite understand why I wanted to go out to dinner when he didn't, we, we cooked at home more. And, you know, uh, I wanted to go drive up to one of the places that he first took me, you know, on our, one of our first sort of getaways. And, you know, I didn't even, I didn't remember where it was exactly. It was nighttime and I was trying to get him to take me. And it was, it was winter. It was February. So it was cold and I wanted to go outside for a walk. He's like, what are we, what are we doing? And so I just, I did, I got on one knee, even pregnant belly and all, and proposed to him. And he's like, once he realized what I was doing, get get up, of, of course, of course, I'll marry you. See, this is, I, it's almost like uh, frustrating looking at this story because it's like, I want to, I guess we all, as pattern seekers, I want to see the signs. And there there are obviously small signs, but I'm also just, this is typical sort of uh, guy who maybe, yes. well, he's already been married a couple, I guess that's a big sign that he'd already been married twice and he's 27 it years is. old or whatever. Uh, but aside from that, he just seems a bit non-committal, not overly effusive or anything, but but okay. He, he wasn't being abusive, was he? I mean, not physically abusive. There was definitely some gaslighting when it came to having, you know, conversations about my feelings. I, you know, there's definitely subtle manipulations on what what I was allowed to believe or feel and things like that. But that's not uncommon in a lot of relationships either. It's not some huge blaring thing. And, you know, the, the truth is a lot of people who have these type of deviances are really good at hiding it because they've had, they've had to live double lives their whole life. And, you know, he told me I was the fourth person he'd ever slept with and I was wife number three. And so this, this built a belief that, well, he didn't date. He just got married. And so I also had a, a, it was kind of comforting in a lot of ways when he did travel for work. I didn't, I didn't think he'd go out to bars and meet people. And so if he was a little less absent, even if the thought crossed my mind, it was, uh, that doesn't make sense for him. That's not who he is. 
And it was really easy to just wipe those things away and remember, no, he's doing all this for us and he's providing for us. And how lucky am I to have somebody who is committed to the family in this way? And that's truly what I believed. Take me through the moment then that you first realized that uh, something was awry. Well, in April of 2016, I now had three children. They were one, four, and almost six. And he just doesn't come home one night. And like, he was late often. And, you know, he would often stay and do work things. And this particular evening, I was expecting him even later because he was supposed to go see his mom after work and pick up some bikes and and do some things. And so when he didn't come home, 10 o'clock, I was messaging him and he had said, you know, is there, is there food? And I figured he was on his way home. And he still doesn't come home. And I actually called his mom and said, Hey, when did he leave? Is he, is he still there? Oh, he left an hour ago. And I thought, well, did he decide to go back to work? Did he get called into something? You know, he worked in IT security. Sometimes there were emergencies in the middle of the night. Usually he could deal with them from home, but perhaps if he was on the road, he went to go deal with something. Maybe he went to go drop the bikes off. I, I didn't know. And I decided to go to bed because I had a nursing child and it was, I figured he'd still live at any point in time. And at two o'clock in the morning, he still didn't come home, called the hospitals. He wasn't there. And my mind is racing at this point. Is he dead? Something happened. This is, this is unlike him. You know, he's late. Yes, but he doesn't come home. Five o'clock in the morning, still not home. At this point, I'm don't know what to do. I've got three sleeping children in the house. I can't go look for him. I don't even know where to go. And I eventually get the idea to call non-emergency dispatch. And most people don't realize you don't have to call 911, but I, I had the number to the non-emergency line. And I said, I know it's not been 24 hours to report him missing, like the TV tells, but, but maybe you can help me. And they said, yes, we can help you, but let's transfer you over to the jail first to see if he's there. Call us back if he's, if he's not. And I said, okay, I'll call you right back. And the shock of my life when the jail answers the phone and says, yes, we have him. And oh. the charge is attempted human trafficking with a $250,000 bond. Oh, that, and this is at what, five in the morning? You're on the phone, what, in, yes. in your bed? Yeah, I'm, at the, I'm in the kitchen because I don't want to wake the nursing child, but yes. At five in the morning, and that's your that's it because you had there was nothing bef- there was nothing before that that is just no that's it he just doesn't come home. How did that feel in that moment? I in that moment I about dropped the phone. I what? I don't even what does that charge even mean? I didn't even have a clue. You know, my mind went to shipping containers and crossing borders with illegal immigrants. I had no idea there was a sex trafficking component of trafficking. I had no idea. Any, we were in we were in a little Colorado mountain town. There was no no borders near us. I huh? And then my you know is his did Tony steal his wallet and and he's should be dead somewhere? Those are the thoughts in my mind. And then the thought that somehow I'm going to be implicated in this if if they think he's involved, are they going to think I'm involved? Because I have no idea what potentially is actually happening. Five a.m. What what do you do? F- for the next few hours. So I'm obviously wide awake at this point. There's no going back to bed now. And I started Googling because I need to understand. And I'm Googling what is the charge mean, not really getting clear answers. I start Googling bail bondsmen, lawyers. You know, I watched enough CSI to know I need somebody to explain this to me. And I'm, the cops are not the answer, especially because I believe there's some mistake. He's caught up in some wrongdoing. And so... I actually get a hold of bail bondsmen at 5.30 in the morning. They are more than happy to discuss how this works because they're obviously seeing potential clients with a $250,000 bond. And most people don't know how this works. And people are often surprised. If you work with a bail bondsman, you basically pay them 10%. It's non-refundable. That's their fee. And then they put up the rest of it once you also have like a lien on the house or something else that if the person didn't show up to court or tried to run from the charges that they could come for the rest of it. And so they're just helping bridge that gap if you don't have the actual cash. And so they're more than happy to talk to me. That's a good $50,000 for them. And, you know, they're, what they tell me is these type of charges, usually the bond gets reduced in bond court, which every state, I'm sure every country does this differently. But in Colorado, 
uh, in about 24 to 48 hours after they're arrested, they go to bond court and bond is officially determined. And so there's kind of a, this charge equals this amount blanket, but then they kind of make their case for potentially less or more, depending on what happened. And so they said, normally these get reduced to $100,000. So it's usually worth it to wait a day or two and see what happens. But he said, he also said he had more access to the jail and would be happy to go check on him for me. And I said, please, part of me wanted to somebody confirm it was actually him. Yeah. Let me know he's okay. Um, you know, my concern is worry for him. I don't have any belief that this could be real. There's no thought in my mind that he could be involved in something this nefarious. All I can think of is he needs my help. And as somebody who's incredibly loyal and incredibly dedicated to family, it's okay. I'm the one to help him. I'm the one who can help get him out or figure out what's going on or get lawyers or whatever it is. Are you still in love with him at this point? Absolutely. Absolutely. I believed he was my person. I believed he was, you know, he was the father of my three children. I, I even, I remember having the thought that maybe he's dead in the middle of the night before I found him. And the thought in my mind is, you know, this man's the love of my life. And what am I going to do with my kids if he's gone? You know, all of those thoughts are still very fresh. Oh, and, then, and then, so you're, I guess it's your and his money you've got to put up for yes, bail. Correct. correct. And he had ownership in the company he worked for and they had been recently purchased. And so we actually had access from an investment standpoint. So I had to go sell a bunch of stocks and bonds and things to get access to the cash. And But I did have the ability to do that. So there wasn't a, in a lot of ways that was great because it didn't mean I needed to forfeit a bunch of money because when you put it up, once the trial is over, whatever the outcome is, you do get the money back. It's really a, an insurance policy for to make sure they show up. That's really the the goal of bond is they try to make it enough that it's pretty uncomfortable if you have to forfeit it. You still need to have a lot of liquid like assets, don't you? A lot of people don't have that. Most people don't have that. And I think in a lot of ways, this type of charge, they don't really want you to be able to bond out. That's why they set it as high as they do. Murder chargers tend to be $500 million bonds for those reasons. Right, right. So then you've got him out then so how long did he spend in jail at that point he spent two days in jail two days in jail basically um, bond court determined they weren't reducing the bond which surprised me but they thought they were going to actually end up charging him with human trafficking instead of, instead of attempted human trafficking they were going to up the charge and didn't want to reduce his bond which shocked me again you know in bond court we started to learn there was more defendants it was federal agents everywhere there was clearly a bigger thing happening but i still didn't really no details. I didn't, un I, I just knew I needed to get him out of there. He didn't belong there. And then when you, when you get him, him out, is he, what's the moment that you next see him and how is that? Cause I, I'm gathering there's a, there must be a mix of emotions here. Absolutely. Um, so I bond him out and you know, he comes out in the work clothes he went to work in two days ago and gets in the car and he breaks down and starts crying and just huge emotional release. And then he says, you know, get, get me the fuck out of here. And I started driving and I just drive and I let him process. And I know he's been through a lot. I don't know what happened or what's going on. So I give him a minute and eventually he starts talking. He knows he needs to tell me what's happening here. And he starts telling me that there was an ad that he responded to. And I'm, uh huh, an ad, an ad for what? I'm not putting two and two together here. And he, he starts saying, you know, he didn't think any of it was real and they wouldn't listen to him. Um, I'm again, not, I don't understand. So I start saying, an ad for what? And he says, Oh, an ad for escorts. Huh? Excuse me. An es escorts. How long has that been going on? Oh, like forever. This is news to me. He's very flippant, very flippant about the fact that he had been seeing escorts. He tells me that he'd been seeing them since he was 20. And his entire adult life, he'd been seeing escorts. And he acted like this was no big deal, although this was absolutely news to me. And then he starts saying, you know, he didn't think it was real when they offered the kids. And so this is the part that, you know, is, it starts to, I start to understand what the charge is really about, what's actually happening. And so the ad was for escorts, but they, when the people responded, they offered children. And they were looking for people interested in, basically having sex with children. 
And so those who responded and continued the conversations and then met, you know, showed up to potentially exchange dollars or meet the kids were then arrested. And so he said he didn't think any of it was real. And he thought, well, if there's any chance that it is real, I need to make sure and report it. But I don't want to get in trouble if it's not. And they're just scam artists or whatever. And so that's his story, is that he would never do anything with kids. But, you know, if he needed to know enough to report it, but he was he was scared of getting in trouble for what he was doing. Did you believe him? I did at the time. Um, he was really good at playing the victim of the circumstances. He was clearly terrified of what was happening. You know, he was the kind of person that liked to solve puzzles. He, you know, he was an IT guy and wanted to understand everything about a situation. And so I, part of me could go, okay, well, it makes sense. He'd want to figure it out. And I didn't still see him as somebody who was interested in so children. He basically, he told me I was the youngest person that he'd ever been with. That was his, what he said. And I was 18 when we started dating. And he was, he was into, or he was, you know, pushing you to have sex with him several times a week because I looked into a lot of these people and I'm trying to not say the name. There are certain names that YouTube will not like if we say them too often in the conversation, which is infantilizing, but it's just, we have to do, but I've looked into those people and you know, they always say, Oh, you can never tell. And you, it's true. You can never tell who they are, but there are quite a lot of them where you're like, Oh, well, it sort of makes sense because the wife would say like, well, we didn't have sex for 15 years, you know, cause he's, yeah. they're usually not interested in, in adults, but, but he, but some, some are interested in both. So is that the impression Correct. you got from him? Yes. Correct. And obviously I still don't understand this yet, but he, it wasn't a like only preference. It wasn't bulbophilia. Uh, it's more the younger, the younger, but you know, still interested. I think he, from his perspective, he liked, you know, the, the excited, the excitable teenagers more than just the, you know, uh, from an adult standpoint, if they're less interested or, it's, uh, you know, in the, the words he would use would be like the, the dead fish reaction. Like he didn't like those type of, those type of interactions. He, he wanted excited, excited teenagers, excited, you know, adolescents, that kind of a thing. So he had it in his mind that like children that have been forced into this would, would be more excited than adult. He had it in his mind that they, they liked it and he was helping them. That's the story he told himself. He was helping them because he was paying them and that they liked it. <sighs> that's just, it's mad. Oh no, that's what he's told you, isn't it? We, I guess we can't really know what was going on. Well, and that's mind. exactly it, right? You know, the, the story he's, he never even years later admitted ever to me that he actually was interested in sex with children. And this is the hard, the hard part is it took me years to really get it because I had a belief about who he was. I had a belief about my, my, who my, what my marriage was, who I was, the, the family dynamic. And it was so far out of that understanding that even the events and his explanation, I, I had to fit it into what I already understood about the world and about myself and about him. And so when he gave me any explanation that kind of made somewhat of a sense, I ran with it. And I, I chose to believe him because I, I couldn't fathom the other, the alternative. I also was terrified to have no kid, my kids fatherless. I had a lot of wounding myself about growing up without a father. I believed kids need, kids need their both parents in their lives. And the idea that he was potentially going to go to jail, be gone for 10 plus years, that was terrifying to me. And so everything I focused on was how do I keep my family together? How do I protect my family? And in my mind, that meant supporting my husband through this offense and through getting, clearly he had a sex addiction. Clearly he needed help with his mental health, but I did not understand the gravity of what I was actually dealing with yet. And then what was it? So over the, the, the weeks after that, you know, how are you and he getting along as the court date looms? So in, this is, this is the, this is the hardest part for people to really wrap their minds around because most people think, you know, things are going to be tension. We're not going to be talking, but the opposite starts to be true because the articles in the paper comes out. People start to ask questions. This is public information now. And I isolate from everybody because people want me to tell them what happened. What am I going to tell them? Sorry. He was sleeping, sleeping with adult escorts. He'd never sleep with children. 
that's not a conversation I can have. And I also have no idea what's going to happen from a criminal trial standpoint. I don't know if this is going to go to full blown trial. I don't know. I don't know what's happening. And so I shut down all social media accounts. I stopped talking to anybody and everybody and completely isolate myself. The only person that's safe to talk to is my husband himself. And oh, like he's not, yeah, he's not allowed at the house because of our young children. That was part of the bond conditions. And he's staying with his mom. And, you know, we begin to be on the phone all the time because I'm completely alone. I'm completely isolated and I'm terrified. And so is he. And so we form a trauma bond. We form a trauma bond because we're the only two people that can understand what's happening. And it actually deepens our connection for a little while. And I believe at this point in time that this is going to be the wake up call he needs, right? I only think that he's still, he's got a sex addiction. I don't think this is, this is a bigger thing than that. I think, okay, people recover from infidelity all the time, right? That's the story I'm telling myself. And so what can we do to actually have the family I always wanted? And so we actually have a stronger connection through his criminal hearing. And we're not allowed to be together unless I get a babysitter. And so that's all we want to do. We spend almost 24-7 on the phone together. Every thought I have starts to go through him. Every every time I even start to have emotions about the fact that my husband cheated on me, it's, I'm, I'm so sorry that, you know, this isn't me again. Things are going to be different. I've learned my lesson. All of the love bombing stuff comes out. I wasn't allowed to have the feelings. I wasn't allowed to think that that anything other than we were strong and working on our marriage. And that continues really um, for an almost another year because his, his court date, um, he gets actually offered a plea deal. And the majority of cases like this are pled out. And most people also don't know this, but majority are pled out and the majority of these type of charges, they don't actually ever serve jail time. And so even though this looming human trafficking charge looks like it's an indeterminate to life sentence, at the end of the day, he was offered a plea deal with zero jail time and only probation. This seems awful. And I, I suppose that's partly because those children were not real. It was part of a sting Correct. operation, like Correct. the Chris Hansen show, Chris, who's been on this podcast as well, Chris. Um, and and that i i don't get that because i think i understand entrapment isn't great you don't want to you know force people or push people to do criminal things and but when it comes to i i you know when it comes to children and things like that i think surely you know i don't, I don't know how he got away with that well and this is this is the hard part for people to realize in in white america a middle class man gets probation for showing up with intent to meet an 11 and 14 year old for sex and there are a lot of people in jail for way less crimes yeah like like smoking weed or something right people right you go to prison for like crazy things like that or like financial things i feel like unless it's a violent or something to children crime i don't i personally don't think we need prisons at all uh, it's but violent people it's different of course you know i don't want to be saying oh let's scrap prisons and then someone gets hurt or because someone's you know but I, I just can't believe it so then so then life as normal for some time is that is that what happened for you it, it, yeah sort of because you know so he accepts the plea deal which does come with sex registration and does come with a felony and i have a pretty hard time with that because i thought we were gonna fight the charge i thought he was innocent <laughs> but he says i'm i'm i can't you know, they're offering basically no jail time. This is not a deal I can turn up, turn away. And, you know, the, my understanding is the legal system's goal is to get these guys into treatment. They believe their sex offender treatment is rehabilitative and that they have a very low reoffense rate. And so they think that's the most important thing, not jail time. And so it comes with enrollment in sex offender treatment, sex offender probation, which is different than regular probation. They have curfews. They're not allowed internet access without safety plans. They're not allowed in schools and around other kids. But in the state of Colorado, there was a Supreme Court update, basically a new precedent was set that said a sex offender does not automatically lose their right to parent. And so the statutes changed. And basically by him pleading guilty to attempted solicitation of a minor, which was the ended up guilty charge, he gained back his parenting rights and he was actually able to move back into the house. He wasn't allowed around other children, but his own children, because of his 
constitutional right to familial association meant he was allowed unrestricted access to his kids. Were you relieved at the time? I was grateful. Yeah, at the time, because I wanted, right, we were, we were getting closer. Our family dynamic was getting better and he was going to be the, the present father that he never had been before. And this was a good thing because we eventually had supervised visitation and all of that while he was going through the criminal proceedings. And that was not fun for the kids. They didn't understand why daddy couldn't be home. And he was love bombing them in the same way. He was, you know, this was daddy playdate time and all of the new gifts and toys. And everybody was so excited to be able to spend time together. And so once he moved back home, and that was January of 2017 now, I thought things were going to go back to normal. I, he had lost his previous job, but he had some opportunities to work for somebody else. He used to, uh, an old coworker had started a company and do some contract work. And I thought, great, he'll get back to a normal schedule. You know, he'll be able to be home with the kids more. He was going to work remotely. I thought things were going to go back to me. And it was not very long after that I started to realize that his mental health was not, was actually deteriorating. And he, he was struggling to focus, struggling to do anything. And he had been in therapy. He'd been put on some antidepressants, but they weren't, it wasn't enough. And I had been out of work for six years. So I had been out of work the whole time, you know, I had children, but I realized that employment gap was only getting bigger. And he was clearly maybe not capable anymore of providing in the way that he had. And so I needed to figure out what I was going to do. And I never was going to make the same money that he made, but I had to start somewhere and I knew that. And so once things were clearly not going back to normal, I started looking for work myself, which was hard. I had young kids, but my youngest at this point was two. And so it was a lot easier to leave. And, you know, his father could be home with him. I didn't have to put him in daycare because he had unrestricted access to him. And I was going to have to deal with drop-offs and pickups and school things, but there was a, there was a lesser burden in a lot of ways. And so I started, I went, I ended up finding a job and going back to work myself April of 2017, which was the first time that I really left that bubble that we had created, that trauma bond bubble. And I started to kind of interact more with the outside world, which was very different. You know, I, I had created this bubble of safety with my husband and my kids. And it was us against the world, us against the legal system, us, us against all of these other things. But all of a sudden, going back to work, I didn't want anybody to know the truth about who I was, who my husband was. I was terrified they were going to find out and I was going to get associated some way with what had happened. You know, they would see my last name and maybe remember what they read in the paper a year ago. And... So I, I kept my worlds very separate. And I suppose that changed how you felt a little bit about him. It started to. Yes. It started to because all of a sudden I realized if my worlds can't connect, which one is the problem? And, you know, I had been living in fight or flight. I had no ability to process emotionally actually what had happened or process the fact that my husband had admitted to cheating on me all those times. I had no no frame of that. And the emotions did finally start to come out. And, you know, he would want to be intimate with me. And all I could feel was all of the escorts. It was like there were ghosts in the room. That's how you looked at them. That's what you wanted to do with them. Those are the thoughts that were repeating in my mind. And I started pushing him away. And I started really drowning my sorrows in wine after work. And I would come home and drink half a bottle of wine before I'd even be able to be affectionate or have a conversation with him. I didn't want to look at him. I was very disconnected. But at the same time, I had just put everything I had into keeping my family together, keeping a father in my kids' lives. I didn't want to separate, but I didn't want this either. And so it was really a struggle for me. And I didn't have anybody to talk to. I didn't know who I could share this with. I didn't want anybody at work to know what was happening. And so this was, this was a challenging moment where I basically just pretended I was fine. You know, and I think a lot of people do that. Yeah. You speak of the, like the ghosts in the room. I suppose what you, you must have been wondering, um, you know, had he used protection and things like that? Did you yes. ask him about that? I did. I did. And he, he did say he did. And he had said that, you know, as I, you know, I had three children. So this all was happening while I was pregnant and breastfeeding repeatedly. 
And he said when I got pregnant with my second that he he went and got tested. And so I'm like, oh, well, you you had conscious thoughts about this might be a problem. And I think this is actually true for a lot of people who live these double lives. They have moments of clarity where they realize potentially the impact they're going to make. And, you know, and then he he would go get tested occasionally when he had those thoughts and things like that. But that generally he swept it under the rug, you know, because the the feelings and the emotions that would come up for me is, you know, you did this unapologetically, potentially affecting my health and the children's health. And you 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 basically are acting with complete callous. And though that's when the anger and the sadness and the rage would come out. And that's when I would get shut down because I'm different now and everything is fine. And, you know, I, I had actually sent him to get tested actually right after he was arrested. And I'm like, you did this, you know, and those kind of things would come up and he would just swear things were going to be different. And I just like every time he would come home late and I would be frustrated, I dropped it. I wasn't allowed to have the feelings. They weren't relevant. And so he's home now. He's here now. He's changed now. It was, that was the belief I kept running with because what, what good would being angry do? What would that actually change? What benefit did that have? And so I shoved it down. And then he, he, am I right in saying he's the one who filed for divorce? He is. Yes. He filed for divorce in October of 2018. And, uh, he did this in a, move basically to force me out of the house and to try to assert his dominance in the family court system because i i at some point i eventually started dating and i started kind of needing to explore other relationships and but i didn't want to affect my family and he he seemed okay with it for a while but once that stopped and he wanted to get back together and i said no i'm i'm actually not happy he his response to that was to file for divorce and file a temporary orders uh, thing with the court to say he was the primary parent and that I needed to move out because I had been gone from the house more than 50% of the time, which was a lie. And this was, this probably made me angrier than any of the things he had done thus far because after everything I did to support him and to keep the family together, he was now actively trying to rip it apart and trying to paint me as a drunk as a bad parent, as all of these things, not taking any accountability for any of how we got there. And so that was definitely a big challenge. And it was kind of, it was ludicrous to me. You know, he wasn't allowed in their schools. How was he going to be a primary parent? It didn't make any sense. But he was still trying to do that with the court system. And I think on some level, he was probably terrified that he was going to, you know, lose access to the children. And so if he established that he was a good and present parent from the beginning, then that would be harder. And so uh, from a temporary order standpoint, we ended up in court fighting for that. And the judge basically told me that unless there was really strong evidence that he was a danger to these children today, she could not remove his access to them because I was arguing for no overnights and just visitation. And she, he had support of his therapist and his probation officer. And so she said, this isn't enough. This isn't enough to remove any type of overnight visit. And so from a temporary order standpoint, so in a, in a family court, you, you have the initial agreement of what you do until the divorce is finalized. And so from a temporary standpoint, we had a 50 50 arrangement and the, the children were going to go back and forth between households four times a week, which was extensive, but the, that was, there was nothing else they could do at the time. This just seems insane, given his history. This is just uh, this just seems like it should be an open and shut case, really. I just can't believe um, some of this. N- and also, now that you now that you're no longer looking at him by this point, you're no longer looking at him as like you know the fear of separation or the fear of breaking up the family. It's like okay, this is happening now. Did it change how you looked back at his crimes? Yes, but I still I started to see the the mental health pieces. I started to see the gaslighting and the manipulation and the. Um, I started to see some of those pieces, but I still didn't see that he was deviant and dangerous. Like that was still too far. That was still too far for me to really wrap my head around because I had spent the last now three years or two years or so believing him. And so I only built up that belief stronger that he wouldn't have gone through with the children and that he wasn't a danger to the children 
I just thought he was manipulative and, you know, kind of an ass. That's really where I was running with. And I was frustrated because the kid's behavior started to change towards me and the alienation attempts were coming out. And he was telling the kids things like, mommy is mad at daddy and that's why we can't be together. And, you know, he was putting all of the blame on me. And so those were, that was my, my focus and frustration is the impact that this was having on the children more than the, the danger, essentially. And what changed all that? So what changed is as the divorce stuff already started to continue, my, my children's behavior changed. And my middle child, who is my very sensitive, at the time, he was also fairly effeminate and acted a lot more like a, like a female than, a, than the, the male body he was in, started to almost get towards me. He would climb in my lap and almost try to kiss me on the lips. And it was like, what is happening? Why are you, what is, what is going on? And I started to have these questions about what was happening at the house. And the alienation attempts were, were loud and they were, they were physically struggling to even want to be with me. And then uh, what really dropped the bottom out for me is I was driving them to school. I was playing a presentation in my head that I was supposed to be giving at work and I was only half listening to them. And I pulled up to the school and my middle child says, sometimes I suck on daddy's fingers. Just out of nowhere. Totally out of nowhere. He says this excitedly. What? I, you, and you can't respond. You can't respond when a child says something like that because you can't scare them. You can't make them shut down. You just have to have almost no reaction. And so I sent him off to school and I called my lawyers and said, something else is happening because my child's behavior is changing. He's, he's acting more sexual. He's seeing these things. Something dark is happening in that house. And the word grooming kept repeating in my head. And, you know, for people who don't know what grooming is, it's, it's a very subtle and a very slow process where you basically move the boundaries and you make what's inappropriate seem normal. And usually it happens through children you already have a relationship with. And so, you know, you just, the affection gets, crosses a line here and there. And kids don't know exactly. They, they might know it feels funny, but they don't have language for it. And especially because, you know, the children were also terrified that daddy was going to be in more trouble. They weren't going to talk about anything like that. Because they, they already didn't like that he was in trouble and had all of these restrictions. And they didn't know the details of his crime. They just knew that he wasn't allowed around other kids and that he was in trouble with the law. Your, your world must have just turned upside down when you heard your son say that. Well, and all of the red flags and the things that I had ignored came crashing in front of me. And it was all of a sudden like the blinders were ripped off. And everything that I didn't want to see or didn't want to put those puzzle pieces together was right there. This is a man who was arrested for trying to have sex with an 11 and 14 year old. Oh, hello. Why did I not see that? How did I ignore that? How did I let myself believe that my kids were safe? How did I put them back in their lives? I put them, I gave him access to them. Like all of that was, I was faced with very loudly. And, you know, my lawyer said, we have to be very careful with any new allegations made in a family court case, especially when you're already fighting over custody. And so I spoke to the kids therapist about what to do. And she said, you need to have him show you what he means. And so I asked my son to show me and it was as bad as I expected. And that's when she said, you can go ahead and make a child protective services report. And I would, as a mandatory reporter, have to if he'd shown me that. And so I did. I reported it to his child protective services. I reported it to his probation officer and all of them. And another very frustrating thing is nothing happened. They interviewed my son oh. who was terrified of them. And said, oh, no, we don't do that anymore. And they dropped it. They, they completely dropped it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And they dropped it. And this was my rock bottom. This was a, the legal system is not going to protect my, my children from a man who was already charged and found guilty for trying to have sex with children. And they're going to basically set up a scenario where they're going to have 50-50 custody. I'm going to have no ability to supervise, no ability to be present in those times. And I didn't know what to do. I felt like I was doing everything. We had hired a parental rights evaluator. I had all the lawyers. I was doing all the things I thought to do. It seemed like there was nothing else I could do. And this was inevitably going to be what happened. But I was not okay with this. 
My word. It's so frustrating. It makes, it makes me want to scream. I can't imagine how you must feel about all of this. I mean, what, what more do they need in these cases with the history he's got and your son saying that, even if he says not anymore? Like, it's ridiculous. Exactly. It doesn't matter, right? And, you know, my motherly instinct to pack my kids in a car and drive across the border was really loud. But the truth is that I would be charged with kidnapping if I did that. So what did you do? So I was spinning in my head. I was trying to figure out what to do. I was in therapy myself. I had been diagnosed with PTSD. My therapist was trying to work with me on calming my nervous system because things were, at this point, high conflict. Every transition felt like a hostage situation. Every transition was about negotiation or change in schedules, this or that. And it was exhausting. It was incredibly difficult on my nervous system on top of the fear that my children were in danger. And it was actually my mental health professional therapist, regular family counselor, who says to me as I'm leaving her office one day, have you ever considered seeing a psychic? And I was like, huh? What? Like a fortune teller? <laughs> I was, you know, I'd been completely agnostic, not spiritual, not religious. You what? And she said, yeah, you know, and I said, do you, is that even real? Do you know somebody who's legit? Because I don't even know that I believe that such thing is possible. And she says, I do, I do. I'll send her the info. And at this point, I'm like, you know, screw it. I'll try anything. Like, I, clearly the legal system's not working. Maybe this lady has some peace I don't know. And, you know, so I go to see this, this psychic. And, you know, she's got crystals and deities everywhere. And she's explaining to me that she sees angels like they're humans, like that she sees them in full form. I go, okay, cool, lady. And, she starts talking to me about past life that she's seeing that me and my husband had together. And it was 500 years ago. He was physically violent and, you know, things were okay kind of until the kids came. And then I was trying to protect them more and stepping in front of them and things escalated. And then she starts telling me all the reasons in that life why I stayed. And it was like she was in my head. It was like she was repeating all of the reasons that I needed to keep a kid in their, uh, you know, the kids in their father's lives. And, I needed, you know, that I, I couldn't be on my own and I couldn't afford to financially provide and all of these things. And it was like, okay, all right, there's, I'm, I'm seeing the thread here and, and, and I'm listening. And then she tells me in that life, he, he beat me to death in front of the children. And my body just has this visceral, like goosebump, crazy response. This fear rises in me because I was terrified of him. He had been so emotionally and mentally manipulative. I felt like he was stalking me at that point. And he was, you know, walking up and down the streets, trying to see into my house. And I was terrified. I mean, he never laid a hand on me. He was never abusive in a way that I had in my head thinking was traditional physical abuse. And I didn't understand why I was so afraid to face him. And in that moment, I, I got where the fear was coming from. And she says, you need to get a handle on that fear because this isn't then. And you get, to, you can own property, you can do things now in a way that you, you couldn't back then. And you need to not operate with that fear. And I said, okay. And then she tells me, the reason you're sitting in this chair is because you still haven't made a choice. And this, this moment is the moment truly that actually changed things. This was my wake up moment because I was like, what do you mean? I made a choice. I'm, I'm doing all the things. I've hired all the people. She says, no, you still haven't actually chosen to be 100% done with him completely. And the truth was, this was a hard, hard thing to really admit to myself. But there was a part of me that still didn't want to believe that he was dangerous. There was a part of me that didn't want this. This wanted my family again, wanted the relationship that I thought I had. They wanted my children to have a present father. And so there was still this little thread, this little hope that I was wrong about it, that there was still some other explanation. There was this little piece of me that didn't want to believe it. And so I was still holding on to some possibility that he was going to get the help he needs and that things were going to be proven differently. And what she was telling me is you have to choose to be done, done with him once and for all. This lifetime and any lifetime, you need to choose. And I said, and so I saw all of that. I saw where I wasn't, I was lying to myself voice. And I said, I'm done. I'm, I stood up. I'm done. And she said, okay, now I can help you. I was like, okay, cool. Tell, I'm, I'm, I'm bought in. I believe you, lady. Like, how can you help me? Because <laughs> I still think I've done everything. 
And she says, there are more people out there who can help you. There are more people who want to help you. You need to keep going. Everybody knows somebody. There's more support out there. And it's not the traditional support you think, but there's more people are out there and you need to keep asking. You need to keep asking for help. You'd be respectful, but keep trying, keep going. And she believed that he had, he was still looking at pornography. And if, if I could, I could prove that, that that would blow his case out, that would be a probation violation. But she wasn't sure if I could actually get anybody to, to prove that. Um, she, you know, basically confirmed for me that he had been abused himself lifetime after lifetime and that he was choosing not to address his own stuff and he was just digging his hole deeper. And he, he wasn't making the choice to address his own stuff and that I couldn't help him unless he made that choice. And that was another big lesson for me is we, we want to help. We want to help. We see the wounded child underneath the people we love. And so we think if we show them love and support, that they'll get the help they need. And it doesn't work like that. They have to choose to change. They have to choose to get help. And so I was needing to basically let go of all of it. And, and she basically just said, keep going. You have a lot of help available, but you had to choose. And now that you've chosen, just keep going. And so I left that office with this new round, new renowned energy, just, okay, there's more I can do. And it was that same day that I went back to work that I was talking to coworkers and I found out one of the people I worked with had an uncle who worked for ICE. And she's, uh, she's been watching my story and says, I'm, I'm going to reach out to him. Oh, okay. And he put me in touch with Homeland Security, who is appalled that a sex offender is, has full access to my children and that we were never interviewed. Our house was never searched. Nobody ever did any due diligence for somebody who was arrested for this. They put me in touch with the arresting officer from Homeland Security who put the cuffs back on him in 2016. He remembers him and he vows to do everything he can do to help me and puts me in touch with a local police officer who is the joint operating op op officer in the, in the sting. And they also vow to help me. And he tries to work with Child Protective Services to reopen the case. They try to get access to through probation to get access to his devices to see if there's pornography. They basically chase all of these possibilities to try to help me. None of those actually turned into anything, but I had people. I had people trying to help. And then my realtor just this ass said, you know, hey, you should you should call the district attorney. And I said, oh, OK, I called him. He said, you know, I can't really do anything. This isn't this isn't in my uh, you know area. But what I can do is I can get you the case file, the criminal case file. Because most people don't realize family members don't see the details. We don't see everything that happened. We, most of the time, they're surprised when trial actually happens. And I had never seen the truth of what happened. I had only ever heard what he told me happened. And the case files are public record. They just need to have some information redacted in order to, to read them and use them. And so he said, I can do those things for you and I'll get you the case file. And so this was the first time that I truly saw what actually happened back in 2016. I saw the transcript between him and the undercover agent and any last hope that I had that this was not real was squashed because I was intimate with the man for many years. I knew his preferences and the way he spoke. And it was very clear to me that he absolutely intended to go through with it. And this was not the first time. And there were some really loud pieces in there that, that I knew were his, were his particular preferences that were just glaring. And he's saying this to what he believes are 11 and 14 year old girls. He believes it's the person who's take or protecting them. So the, the agent is the, is the person who's offering to, to purchase them basically. That's yeah. just unbelievable. It's unbelievable to me that these guys do it anyway. Um, but that they would be stupid enough to speak to another adult and admit all this stuff. I just, you know, I can't believe that. They're, they, if, if they think everybody bought into this being okay, then yeah, I don't, eh. so I see all of this. And so I'm still having to give my kids over four times a week, back and forth, right? Because court was scheduled for February of 2020. And so I see the psychic in January of 2020. I have six weeks. It's six weeks to get the evidence they need to prove in court. And things had only escalated with the kids. Things were only getting worse. Clearly, his mental health was still deteriorating. We brought back the evaluator to add to, you know, to because everything needs to be channeled through from a, in a court perspective to, you know, a, 
third party who isn't who isn't biased in the same way. And so everything gets funneled through the evaluator. Everybody is interviewed. I'm just trying to get as much evidence as I possibly can. And so I start re- also start recording my kids. I start reading them books about body safety. I also get more disclosures from my kids about what's actually going on in the house. And I get those things recorded. And the evidence I'm getting stacks up. And by the time we had court, I have a three-inch binder full of evidence of every conversation, every every piece of questionable information that I want to be part of the case. And, you know, our evaluated reports is another whole one-inch binder full of 100-some-odd pages of data. And his evidence is two or three stapled pieces of paper. And so, clearly, I'm I'm in this to really, to have this case. And, you know, I've got a great legal team behind me. I have, I know where the evaluator stands in her recommendations. She's, you know, he's been diagnosed with dependent personality disorder, passive aggressive personality disorder, major depression, anxiety. His mental health is clearly part of this case. And when they did psych evals on me, I'm, believe it or not, normal. That was, a, <laughs> that was a good release. But, you know, I had all of this evidence to make my case. And we go to court February 28th, 2020. And I had no idea what was coming world at that point. But we make our case in court and we make our case. The kids are in danger now and they are in danger today. There is enough questionable things going on. His mental health is not being addressed. And that all of these things together with his addictive personality, with his mental health, the, the clear grooming behavior is showing that the kids are in danger today. And I bring forward the finger sucking incident. I show the judge exactly what my son showed me. I talk about how I am trying to act as a protective parent, not an alienating, alienating one. I'm not trying to, you know, just win in this case. I'm really just trying to protect them. And, you know, my, he, my son had said that he was climbing into their beds at night and sleeping with them. And the judge was appalled at that behavior and ordered him immediately to stop being with them. And, you know, in a court case like that, they, they got to go through all the evidence. This was a whole day long, eight hour trial. And so it was, that was a Friday. And then the, the following Tuesday, our orders came through. And my lawyer calls me and says, they came through. I'm going to send them to you. Sit down, read them, and I'm going to call you back. Okay. And I'm reading through them. And, you know, she's, the statutes in all of the 50 states have really gone more and more to 50-50. And it is very, very hard for people to have parenting rights removed now. There's, there's not a primary custody in the same situation. And so you know, they're having to follow all these statutes and answer all of the legal pieces. And so what the judge decides to do is she basically immediately removes his overnights, which is, which is huge at this point. She gives him only two afternoons of time a week. And then she says he has six weeks to comply with a large list of requirements. He needs, you know, a family therapist involved. He needs evaluations done. He needs to get a job. He needs to do all these things that he'd been refusing basically to do. He'd he had been refusing to do anything the court wanted him to do. And if he completes these things, then he will have access to them. He'll have every other weekend. And if he doesn't do these things, then he will only ever have supervised visitation. And so my, my lawyer is worried that I'm, I'm going to be upset by this. But there's a part of me that knows that he's incapable, that he hasn't done anything thus far. He's not, his mental health is only worse, that he's not capable, and it was only going to be a matter of time. And so I took it as a win. I took the huge protective measures as a huge win because there was no more overnights. There was nothing else, you know, that I, I, I just needed to wait. And, you know, obviously two weeks later, nobody knew what was happening and the pandemic hit the world. And so my kids were never quarantined with him. They were only with me when everything, everybody went home full time. They were with me. And then those six weeks went by and not a single thing off that list was completed and no compliance was filed with the court. And April of 2020 was the last time we have now heard from him. It just was over. That was it. Fantastic. Good. Good. Yeah. How how are your kids now? They're they're great, honestly. They're obviously things are very different. You know, three three years now have passed. They're they're older, you know, the there was a loss of a parent that we had to process because they didn't know how dang, how much danger they were in. And that was a challenge, but also everything changed at that point in time. They all schools changed, work changed. Everything about their life changed. And in a lot of ways, that was, it was a huge healing time for us. We got to reestablish our mother child relationship because it had been very difficult. And now I'm their safe person again. You know, they come to me, they trust me, they talk to me. 
you know, we've, we've moved around a couple of times and I'm, I'm where they're grounded to. And they, some of them, especially actually my middle son has more questions about his dad and what happened. And I really try to be as age appropriately honest and transparent as I possibly can, because blame needs to be placed in the appropriate place. It's not something I did. It's not something they did. He made the choice not to get the help he needed, knowing the consequences. And that was his choice and his choice alone. Do you think he might be a a psychopath? I don't know that he's a psychopath exactly, but he's definitely completely pathological. I think that his ability to lie and to believe his lies is on that level. Um, you know, they're, they're polygraphed as, as sex offenders. And I, I think he believes his bullshit enough that he can basically just lie straight through it. And, you know, I've, I've done a lot of work in the last three years to come to the place where I can have these conversations and I can look at my choices and the things that I did with the information I had at the time. And, you know, I, I truly believe on some level that he, was glad for it to be over and that he could stop fighting too and that he could you know i think that may have been the rock bottom that he needed on some level because it got to be over it's a story of a lot of darkness but it's also a story of triumph and one that you tell brilliantly and beautifully so people watching this please do get the sex trafficker's wife uh there's people you know it's an acclaimed book it's selling people you're great um you're great at telling your story so i do hope people support you and and also learn a lot from you by getting hold of that book um thank you for coming on amanda thank you anyone watching uh more stuff will be popping up above my head um so keep watching